thanks Siobhan thanks so much for that introduction and thanks Nikki for um for inviting for inviting me I see I see somebody's found, found the clap in 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 the chat there we go we'll get 229 claps now um as, as the chat goes crazy um thanks so much for having me um so yeah so I'm going to try to um uh talk through the impacts of the crisis so far the um the implications for the future um and what i see is some of the really significant challenges that we're facing and what we can what we can do about that um i i think it's fair to say this has been the most extraordinary nine months um i think you know from the probably for all of us have experienced in our working lives um i don't think anyone could have anticipated that we'd have um that we'd have a labor market shock well clearly a public health crisis of this scale uh, and a labor market shock of this severity um so quickly um and i think for me um personally and i think you know it has for all of us it's been a it's been a hugely um a hugely sort of challenging and, and and demanding time but also one where where there's been huge opportunities for us to be able to influence um public policy um delivery and try to support um try to support the recovery particularly for those who are most disadvantaged by the changes um that, that are happening and by the impacts on our labor market I mean, I've, I've certainly felt in the last sort of few months like a, like the proverbial broken broken clock in that there's only really um one thing that i know really well about labor market policy and uh, and employment over the 20 years or so i've been working on it and that is around how do we support disadvantaged groups in labor market crises so having sort of banged on about these sort of things from time to time um it, it's remarkable how when these when these moments come around every 10 or 20 years um uh actually you know you have the opportunity to say something that, that, that people might want to hear or might um or might indeed be useful for for some people i'm really i'm so grateful to have the opportunity to 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 speak here um uh albeit in not the most propitious um circumstances so i'm going to talk through start off really by talking through the impacts of um of the crisis and why this matters i'll probably spend about 20 minutes doing that and then then we'll really focus on the response so far what I see is four sort of really big challenges for the future, and then um, and then you know where we go from here, um, what what the implications are, as I say, for developing that sort of person-centred, responsive and and effective system. Now, the first point I think I'd make, which I don't think will be lost on any of us, is that the scale of this crisis has dwarfed the impacts, has dwarfed anything we've seen in the last forty years. So this is from the Office of Budget Responsibility, and it sets out. If you look at the black box, that is the um, that's the, the annual impact on. Sorry, that that's the that's so far the cumulative impact on um, on GDP from the recession itself. And this is far in excess. This is a this is a you know four or five times magnitude impact that we've seen in the previous three crises. When we look internationally, you know, everywhere has been affected by this crisis. This is um, this is the OECD's forecast of the, G the year on year. Not, so this isn't just the impacts of the crisis, the year on year GDP impacts of COVID-19. Um, the yellow line in the middle is the, G is the average impact. Everywhere has been, been hit. We've been particularly hard hit. So we're in a select group with Spain, France, Italy and the Czech Republic seeing impacts of above 12%, in our case 14% forecast year on year impacts. And that reflects a few things clearly it reflects um the the occupational mix and and and, and the nature of our labor market where we have a lot of jobs that are in face-to-face site -face services that have been particularly affected and it also clearly affects you know the reflects the inadequacy of our public health response in the early stages of the crisis and and the, the slowness with which we lock down so we are particularly significantly affected when we talk about a v-shaped recovery again this is an OVR forecast of what's going to happen to um in this case you know the return to growth pretty really clear that the v-shape is going to um, run out of legs you know, this is there is going to be a permanent hit to the size of the economy they've, they've updated their forecasts of the purple and the blue line are different forecasts the black line is outturn outturns running slightly ahead of what we thought would be the case in the summer but it's looking like we're going to have a couple of percent permanent scarring effects um, on the labor market and permanent scars you know um, mean that you know we're going to see significant impacts for some groups um, in some communities um, as well as quite significant structural change underneath that however we're not quite seeing these impacts in the labor market yet or at least they're taking some time to feed through so here i've set out on the left hand side what's happened with the employment rates over the last couple of quarters um well actually i mean i've set up the employment rate over the last five years but you can see clearly you know, a, a fall in the employment rate from 76 and a half to just over 75 percent over the last three quarters and unemployment starting to creep up 
Um, overall, that fall in employment, which I'll come on to in a sec, is about half a million. The increase in unemployment is in the low hundreds of thousands. But it's worth saying, you know, in the original OBR forecast, Office of Budget Responsibility forecast, it was around this point, we thought that we'd be seeing unemployment of at least two and a half million, potentially nudging three million. And actually, I thought in the summer where, that was where we were heading when we saw some of the really worrying increases, particularly in benefit receipt in the early part of the crisis. And the reason we've not seen those impacts, as we know, is because the job retention scheme, for the most part, has worked. We put that nine million jobs on ice, nearly one third of all private sector employment um, uh, was furloughed at one point or another. But this wasn't just in shutdown sectors. So we can see here that wholesale and retail and accommodation and food services, uh, which is shorthand for hospitality for these purposes, um, between them accounted for about three million um, of the nine million jobs. We also saw really significant rates of furlough in manufacturing, in construction, and in administrative and support roles um, too. So actually, this has been a whole, you know, the whole economy has been affected here, particularly the whole private sector economy has been affected here. Um, and we've seen those, and we've seen those impacts falling really across the country. Furlough worked for many, but it didn't work for all. Um, I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, but those impacts will come. You know, we will see rising unemployment. Um, uh, and the OBR now forecasting, again, the blue line is current forecast um, of unemployment, and now forecasting about 7.5% peak um, in the early part of 2021. That would be the equivalent of about 2.5 million. So we're looking at unemployment rising by up to about a million more. Um, albeit, albeit they've um, significantly, as I say, significantly reduced their forecast impact. Now we can take a view, and one of the things we might want to discuss later is whether this is too optimistic or too pessimistic. Whatever happens, we're going to see really significant effects on the labour market. We're either going to see them in unemployment or we're going to see them in hours and pay. Um, and they're going to be long lasting. Um, uh, I'd probably urge more, oh, I'll come back to it actually. I, I, I'd probably urge more on the side of that this may well be an underemployment rather than an unemployment crisis. I'll come back on that. So, overall, we think that about a million people have lost paid work in the crisis. Um, but the official employment figures have come down by, by just over half a million. The gap between the two is people who, who in effect were furloughed, were laid off temporarily, continued to say that they had jobs, but weren't being supported through the job retention scheme. We think this was particularly affecting people in like casual work, short hours work, um, uh, and, in, you know, and, and, in, and in some particular sectors like hospitality, for example, cleaning and other, um, and other sort of business support services. Now, interestingly, that fall in employment, about half a million, has fed through both into higher um, unemployment of about 250,000, but also higher economic inactivity. So that's people who are neither looking nor available for work. That economic inactivity has risen because people have been caring for family, for example, or it's because they've been discouraged from looking for work or because they've had a, a long-standing health condition or, or, you know, or, or they've been off, off work sick, which includes people who've been off work because of, um, of COVID-19 itself. And what we're seeing with rising unemployment now, for the most part, is, is a delayed impact from the first crisis, from that, that early lockdown. There's more people who were, who, who'd lost work early on, uh, are starting now to look for work, are becoming unemployed, moving from inactivity into unemployment. Um, that will continue to happen, actually. So whatever happens, we're going to continue to see unemployment rising, even as the economy recovers. But interestingly, when we look at some of these differences by gender and by types of employment, we start to see some quite important differences emerging. So at a headline level, employment for men and for women um, has, has, has been pretty similar, actually. We've seen a slightly larger form of employment for men than, than, than for women, but, but we've seen both sort of similarly affected. But underneath that, we clearly see differences depending on whether people work full time or part time, or whether they're self-employed or employees. So here on the left hand side is men, the right hand side is women. Um, and for men, the dark grey there is, is men who are working full time as self-employed. So huge falls in self-employment, driven by fewer men working self-employed. Um, for women, on the right hand side, everything below the line is, um, is either part-time work or it's full-time self-employed work, which is a very small fraction of the fall for women. So we've seen really significant falls in part-time work for women. But for both men and women, we've seen large increases in, in full-time employee work. Um, and for women, we've now got more women in, um, in full-time employee work um, than, than we've ever had. So record levels. So what's explaining this? There's probably three things going on here. The first um, is, is, um, is what we often see in recessions, which is second earners increasing their hours as a consequence of a, of a primary earner um, losing work or losing income. But the second is 
um, likely to be how employers are responding to the job retention scheme. Because, we, because our job retention scheme doesn't allow for short time working, um, it only allows for full furlough or no furlough, we're likely seeing some part-time um, women being temporarily laid off through the job retention scheme and others having their hours increase. Um, and the third thing we're probably seeing is the fact that because women are overrepresented as key workers, particularly um, in the NHS, we're likely seeing a lot of people who are on part-time contracts significantly increasing their hours because of the increased demands of this crisis. So we often talk in the labour market about involuntary part-time work. And I think there is, you know, there's a risk that we see an increase in involuntary part-time work in this recession recovery. But I think we're probably also seeing some involuntary full-time work too. People working longer hours than they want to, or that's good for them, or you know, that's support their well-being or or, um, or their wider lives. Um, and again, I think it's something we're going to have to really think about and address as we um, as we come out of this crisis. Now I mentioned a lot of people have slipped through the cracks in this crisis. Um, and in many cases, they've ended up on universal credit. So more than a million, more than a million new claims for universal credit in the first few months of the crisis, which is a phenomenally, staggeringly large number of, of people um, falling out of work, losing incomes and having to claim benefits. Um, and the increase in the claimant count, I've mapped it here, I've plotted it here going back to 1920, um, when we first introduced um, uh, social insurance, the dole, uh, um, as it was called, and we still sort of call it now, um, uh, 100 years ago. I mean, this has been the fastest growth in the claimant count, which is a measure of people who are claiming benefits and required to look for work. So not a true measure of unemployment, but people who are required to look for work on benefits. Fastest growth in the claimant count we've ever seen. And it's now um, touching levels that we've only ever seen before in about you know, three or four occasions in, in the Great Depression, in the 1980s recession, the 1990s. Clearly, as a, as a rate of, um, of the population, it would be a slightly different graph. You know, we have a far higher rate of unemployment in, um, in the 1930s. Um, but these figures, are, these figures are, are, are staggeringly high. Um, and we're not yet seeing, as I said, seeing this feed through into the real labour market. But I think we will. You know, we will this, is, this is a sort of precursor of what we're likely to see. If, if we're not able to support people back to work quickly as we come out of the crisis. So I wanted to, so that's sort of very headline view of what's going on in the labour market, but what does this mean for different groups? And who do we think are sort of losing out? And who do we think are most affected? And what do we think should be the focus for when we're thinking about sort of public policy responses? So this has been a quite an area of focus for, for us or for um, IES for, for part of the work that we do in the bit that's focused on kind of labour market policy and analysis. Um, and so I wanted to draw out broadly kind of four groups where we're seeing really, or five groups actually, where we're seeing really significant impacts. The first is people in low pay, less secure, often part-time work and who are self-employed. Um, so quite early on, we did this work with Standard Life Foundation, looking at low pay in particular. And we found that the likelihood of being away from work in the early months of the crisis, March, April, was twice as high if you were low paid compared with if you were not low paid. By higher pay here, we just mean paid above um, the real living wage. So it doesn't mean, doesn't mean earning a fortune, it means you know, being paid above about £10 an hour. Um, twice as likely to be away from work if you're low paid and if you're not. Second group, disabled people. Again, early part of the crisis, disabled people significantly more likely to have been furloughed. Partly this reflects occupational factors, but actually I suspect a lot of this reflects disabled people um, being kind of involuntarily furloughed because employers weren't able to accommodate um, uh, adjustments to enable them to keep working during, during the first lockdown. But look, this gap didn't close at any point um, uh, right, right through to late September. So even as the economy reopened, we still had far higher rates of furlough amongst disabled people. And I could show you as well a different graph showing the disability employment gap. The, disability, the gap in employment rates between disabled and non-disabled people is, um, is around 25%. And having, full, having narrowed for the last seven years, it's now started to widen again. Um, hugely concerning, um, hugely concerning trends with disabled people. Thirdly, though, there are very clear gendered impacts of this crisis. And I've talked about um, how we've seen that in the employment figures. The work we've done for the ILO, where we've looked at wage gaps, um, we've looked at wage impacts across every European Union country between women. Showing that in the UK we see more significant differences in wage falls between women and men than in any other country in Europe. Um, us and Belgium are tied. The gap here. So here, if you, you can't see the detail, but the blue line is the average fall in wages for women. The red line is the average fall in wages for for men. This is um, sorry. This is earnings, I should say. So um, so it combines basically your wages and employment. So it's it's kind of it's individual earnings um, falls. So this is a league table where you really don't want to be at the top. Um, but as you can see, we're pretty close to the top on um, on falls overall, and the gap between our red and our blue lines is as high as anywhere in um, as high as anywhere in Europe. 
And I just wanted to focus on one group in particular, which is lone parents, single parents, where um, single parents have been significantly more likely, work we've been doing with gingerbread, um, been significantly more likely to have had to be away from work during lockdowns than couples, parents and people without dependent children. That's not a surprise, obviously, you know, that, that is not a surprise that, 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 that many single parents have not been able to work during lockdowns. Um, and again, some of it reflects occupational factors too. But one of the things I think um, that I think is particularly con concerning here is how little we, we are doing to support single parents through the particular impacts of this crisis. And one really simple fix the government can do, which we've been calling for for a while, is for the new test and trace support payment. Um, to extend eligibility to that so that if your child tests positive or if your child um, uh, is in a class where a school bubble has collapsed and the parent is entitled to apply for the test and trace support payment for you know, single parents. The fact that the government is not doing that, I just find bizarre and sort of beggar's belief. And, and I was really pleased the Welsh government have introduced this um, just this week um, to ensure that where, where, children, where children cannot go to school, parents are not being penalised um, and parents have not seen their incomes being lost and are able to apply for the test and trace support payment on the same basis if they weren't able to go to work. Um, the fourth group I wanted to flag, or the fourth issue I wanted to flag was around ethnicity and clearly there are really di diverse experiences here um, for different groups um, and, and, um, uh, and again you know this, this reflects a range of factors not, not, just, not just people's ethnicity but there are some really standout differences here. When we're looking at, this shows the increase in unemployment, unemployment rates. Um, uh, uh, blue is pre-crisis, yellow is, um, is during the crisis. We can see in particular that, um, that Pakistani people and black people have seen significantly higher increases in unemployment um, than, 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 than any other ethnic group. Um, and particularly for white people where the, the growth of unemployment has been relatively small so far. And underneath this data, this is being driven in particular by increases for Pakistani men um, and for black um, and, and for black women. We're not yet seeing, we're looking at areas, um, we're not yet seeing disproportionate impacts when we look between places. Um, although, um, so this graph shows the, um, the proportion of the population who were claiming unemployed before the crisis began, if you're looking from left to right, and then the percentage point change or the growth in claiming unemployment um, during the crisis, if you're looking from bottom to top. So if this were perfectly a uh, diagonal line from bottom left to, to, to top right, then that would mean that areas that were higher before had seen much bigger increases. In fact, actually, we're seeing fairly consistent increases of between about two and four percentage points across pretty much all places. And that sort of reflects, well, it does reflect the broad-based nature of this crisis. It also reflects that, that, that strangely, uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly, um, some more disadvantaged areas have been relatively insulated in terms of job losses because they've been more reliant on public sector employment, where the public sector has been pretty well protected so far, um, and or they've had relatively weaker private sector um, economies. A couple of areas that stand out though are, are, are London boroughs and areas of airports where we've seen really significant rises in claim unemployment and often quite high unemployment to begin with. Um, London, as, as you'll know, is a number of really quite disadvantaged boroughs. Uh, and this is explained by very high levels of job insecurity, temporary employment, self-employment in particular um, uh, in London. So I think um, that's one way of looking at the sort of area impacts. But the other is to consider um, how tough the job market is um, and how, um, how many um, vacancies there are for the number of people who are trying to compete for jobs. Um, what we, what we were doing using online vacancy data um, tried to illustrate this local authority level um, and we found, perhaps unsurprisingly, that when you look at the number of claimants per vacancy, it is actually the areas that you would expect that, that are facing the toughest recoveries, facing the most significant challenges coming out of this crisis. So that's inner city areas, um, it's ex-industrial areas, um, in particular the central belt of Scotland, uh, the Welsh valleys, parts of the northwest and northeast. Um, and coastal areas, coastal towns, really significantly affected in the early part of the crisis, you know, largely reflecting relatively weak economies, but also quite high reliance, obviously, on hospitality. And so how we can think differently about how we support disadvantaged areas, how we, um, how, how we can better tailor and target our responses, and how we understand local labour markets as we come into recovery is going to be really important, it's going to be key. But the final group I just want to highlight clearly is young people. Um, and young people face this quadruple whammy um, in this crisis. They all, they're always disadvantaged in labour market crises, but in particular um, what would be um, a sort of double whammy of them um, being far more likely to be changing jobs 
far more likely to be losing jobs um, is exacerbated further in this crisis because the lockdowns hit just when summer recruitment was starting um, and just um, and, and just now we're going into quite a weak patch anyway for recruitment around this time of year and um, so we're going to see um, so we're going to see you know some time yet before we see a recovery in that um, but also youth rich um, jobs rich sectors have been those that have been hit hardest so hospitality retail and entry-level jobs in administration so you know particular concerns about the impacts on young people and you see this really clearly in the um, in the headline employment data more than half of the fall in employment has been amongst um, people aged 16 to 24. they make up um, they, they make up about um, one in eight of the workforce so these are really significantly and disproportionately large impacts on young people. We're also seeing quite disproportionate impacts on, on the very oldest, on people aged 65 plus. There's a share of the workforce, this is a bigger figure than it looks on, on this graph. But, um, but, but, but it does stand out, there's people who are in the least secure employment, who, who are in most vulnerable jobs and who are in uh, earliest on in their careers who are being most significantly affected. This is even after, this is an analysis we've done looking at um, in the labour force survey, looking at the proportion of people who are not working normally um, during the first lockdown. These really significant impacts on young people were even after um, uh, quite significant um, uh, support through furlough schemes um, and, uh, and, and people working reduced hours in lieu of um, actually losing their jobs. We estimate that about two fifths of all 16 to 24 year olds were either working reduced hours or had been furloughed um, during the first lockdown. But this also illustrates quite clearly how, um, how you know, as you, as you then get into, into older ages, into 50 plus, 55 plus, 60 plus, you start to see really significant rises too. I'll skip through that one. Um, now, a lot of the focus um, inevitably has been on redundancies. Um, so here's just a few of the kind of headlines in August as redundancy activity started to really um, gather pace. And we're starting now to see the redundancy figures um, feeding through into, um, uh, start, starting to see some of this noise feeding through into the data itself. So we, we've been doing some work, um, you, uh, we've got a, a freedom of information request of, of um, eight called HR1 notifications, which is when there's notifications of people are going to be made, um, are going to be made redundant, redundant in large exercises. Um, and this is a good early warning of what's happening in um, what's going to happen in subsequent redundancies. So we set out here, the blue shows the HR1s, which is notifications of future redundancies, and the yellow shows actual redundancies. So HR1 notifications um, during the crisis were running far in excess of what they did in the previous crisis, 2008 to 2010, which is on the left-hand side here. Um, you know, um, double the rates that they were um, uh, 10 years ago. And this will translate, it lags, as we can see here, the yellow line lagging, the, the blue line, it will translate into rising redundancies. And the yellow line inevitably ends up higher than the blue line because a lot of redundancies are smaller and so aren't notified. So redundancies are now doubled in three months. They're now at the highest level they've ever been. We think they're gonna keep rising. We think there's a change of scale on the left, left hand side here, but we think, um, we think they're gonna peak at about 450,000 as a quarterly measure. So it'll be off that chart, the chart that I previously showed probably going to peak um, somewhere um, somewhere up if you can see my mouse it'll be somewhere up above the um, above uh, above the the end of the graph they're going to be there in the next month or two and that's baked in there's nothing that we can do about that now about 680,000 in total we're anticipating the second half of the year but it's worth saying um, and I think you know there's been a lot of a lot of downers in this presentation there's some you know there's some positives too it could have been incredibly incredibly worse than than, than 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 we've actually seen in total around five million people have left furlough this shows the, the number of the millions of people who were temporarily away from work during the crisis it peaked um at the end of april at nine million people temporarily away from work all into four million by the end of september and an analysis by hmrc shows the vast majority of these people have moved into moved into jobs they've moved into their old jobs so um, they'd move back into the jobs they were doing. So we haven't seen millions of redundancies, but we have seen an exceptionally high number, far more than, 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 than we would have hoped, um, far more than we would possibly want to see. Um, but it's important to note, I mean, much of what happens in the labour market is about flows. All of what happens really in the labour market is about flows. Um, and this isn't just about job losses. In fact, there are signs now, I think, that the, the hiring crisis that we're now facing is likely to be worse than the firing crisis that we saw in the early stages, the first six months of, um, of, of, of this pandemic. 
The blue bar here shows the number of people who've moved into work from being out of work by quarter. And the yellow bar shows the number of people who've moved from being in work to being out of work. Uh, and then the line through the middle showing the number of people moving from job to job. So previously in a job to then in a job. This is from Labour Survey. What stands out here clearly is that the blue's gone down and the yellow's gone up and, and so have job to job moves. Job to job moves always decline in recessions. But in the past, in previous recessions, fall in job to job moves coupled with a recovery in hiring has actually tended to be good news for unemployed people. The number of people unemployed moving into work tends to increase in downturns because or immediately as, you, as, um, as the recession ends but while the economy is still weak because fewer people are moving jobs and so unemployed people tend to actually then be moved be starting to take up the jobs and being advertised. What's concerning here but we do need to see more data is that in July to September the quarter when the economy reopened largely reopened fewer people started a new job through worklessness than had done during the full lockdown itself during the period April to June more people started new jobs from worklessness during first lockdown than did during the reopening. So we really, really need to get hiring up. The number of people leaving jobs fell, and I think it will continue to fall. It will fall back towards the levels it's been in the past, I think. But if we don't get hiring up, we will see an inexorable rise in unemployment. And we'll see that feeding through into long-term unemployment really quite quickly. Um, but as I said uh, at the start, I, mean, I, I, I think there's a further challenge here, which is that we may actually avert an unemployment crisis, but find ourselves facing an underemployment one instead. And so I just wanted to bring, put this slide back up just to illustrate here. If you look at the green, this shows the, the, um, uh, how much of the fall in GDP is explained by the average hours. The blue is, um, uh, the yellow is how much is explained by productivity. And the blue is how much is explained by falls in employment. Um, now, can you still hear me? I hope you can. I just froze up there. I hope you can still hear me. But so I was just saying the green and the yellow here um, and show, show impacts from productivity and hours, whereas blue is employment. What's really striking in the last, um, the last two recessions is how far the fall in um, uh, output is explained by um, hours and is explained by productivity. It's not explained yet by falling employment. Now, I do think it will be. I do think employment is going to start to feed through. But there's every chance that this will continue to be characterised by people working fewer hours, by people um, being paid less, um, uh, and by people in you know having less secure work than they did previously. And our institutions, our policy response is just not well set up to, to deal with underemployment, to deal with supporting people who are in low-paid, insecure work, rather than people who are unemployed and coming into contact with the benefit system. I need to speed up a bit, so apologies. I'll skip through to some of these slides. Um, now, I think one thing that the OBR have, have highlighted, have illustrated, is that we're going to see really significant sectoral impacts, um, and they're probably not all going to be where we'd expect. A lot of these are, but not all of them. So the key things to look at here is the, the second column along, the one that shows the January to November change in GDP, and then the third one along, which shows what they're forecasting to the end of the year. So we're seeing really significant hits in accommodation of food services and other services. Other services pick up a lot of kind of business support services, as well as things like hairdressing and other things that involve face-to-face -face and face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. There's a really significant effect. But we're also seeing you know, continued um, uh, um, uh, really significant impacts further down when you're looking at administration and support services. It really worries me because these are kind of entry level roles, often, you know, things where where um, people, other people working in those organisations are continuing to work, working remotely, but we're seeing hiring freezes across large parts of the service economy. Um, and interestingly, quite significant impacts on human health, which isn't, you know, which is which includes public health, but actually is, um, is much broader than this. It's also um, it's also other health services, things like dentistry and so on, and things like um, occupational health services or um, or uh, uh, you know osteopathy or whatever, you know, um, whatever it could be, any number of health services. So we're actually seeing you know quite significant impacts across different parts of the economy, which are not all about shutdown sectors at all. And interestingly, retail, um, which is a little oasis of green on the third column over. Um, year on year is likely to be a similar size. The composition of retail is going to change, but I do think you know the ABR is saying, and I sort of subscribe to this view too. I think you know the death of retail um, is probably somewhat overstated. We're seeing significant structural change in retail, but we'll continue to be a nation of shoppers, and we'll continue to create jobs in retail, and so we'll continue to be a challenge how we create good quality jobs. Um, so looking ahead, how bad can this get? So we don't know for sure what the impact of the second lockdown has been. It looks like it's probably about 4 million people furloughed. Um, by October, the economy was recovering. 
um, but things are still weak. Um, I think a lot of employers have been doing the right thing, trying to bring people back. This is creating quite significant spare capacity um, in the labour market, and that's going to continue to weigh down hiring, and it's likely to lead to you know, weak pay growth and real pressure on pay. Um, I think this is really likely to drag on, and clearly like Brexit is a really significant risk. But like I've said, I do think um, you know, the, the bigger crisis, the bigger risks we're facing now, potentially around underemployment and unemployment. But having said all this, you know, if and when we do finally get through this, um, the, the, the extensive measures that have helped to support business um, uh, finances and household finances mean that we may well see quite a strong recovery, probably in the latter part of 2021 and in 2022. But we'll see how that, how that, um, pans, how that pans out. Now, I just wanted just you know to pause for a second on why this matters. So, becoming unemployed, particularly in recessions, as we know, leads to permanent scars, and this has been really well evidenced. And this is most pronounced for young people. But I think you know this isn't just about the impacts on individuals. This is also about the broader um, uh, uh, economic and fiscal costs too. There's really great work done about a decade ago which tried to quantify these, and which I think gives us a business case for why we should be investing to support people who are disadvantaged, who are long-term unemployed, and who are um, and who are most affected in crises. And it's worth saying that research as well shows that you know this isn't inevitable. That if we can address this, if we can intervene earlier, if we can better support people out of work, then we can help to reduce negative effects um, of being unemployed. History, though, tells us. We look at the impacts of how unemployment has changed. This shows changes in unemployment uh, for the last three recessions, where grey is the recession itself, and then uh, the unemployment rate is the is the subsequent lines. Nineteen eighties is the big one. The early eighties recession is the big one. History shows us that unemployment impacts take years to work through, not months. So we're probably in the foothills of the crisis in terms of the impacts on unemployment. It's going to take a long time. It is going to define, I think. Um, our um, economic and social policy for the next five years. And long-term unemployment in particular um, lags the impacts in the economy because long-term unemployment is ultimately driven by, um, by um, people claiming, you know, that a year before, in effect, they become long-term unemployed. It's driven by weak um, outflows following spikes in, in people flowing into unemployment. And young people here, is, the, the, the blue line here is youth long-term unemployment in the last recession. Which, which, was, which, which reached its peak nearly five years after the last crisis. So, a word on the response so far. Oh, hang on, that's, um, that's the wrong slide. Um, a word on the response so far. That, there's a snazzy animation for this. If you want to send it through, you can play it yourself. But it looks like it's not quite translated, unfortunately, into the, um, in, in, into the, uh, into the Blackboard thing. There's been at least like two dozen different initiatives, different interventions announced by government across um, apprenticeship hiring subsidies, careers investment, um, the restart scheme, uh, the um, uh, uh, kickstart program, the shared prosperity fund, doubling of work coaches, um, huge amount of government has done to its credit to recognise some of the risks we've been talking about, um, but huge questions too about how and whether this stacks up for individuals, um, for employers, uh, as a single coherent offer for the people who'll be trying to deliver this and, and for local partners who are trying to make sense of this and to coordinate provision. And we're doing it at a time when we've actually never spent less on contracted out employment programmes. So we're now spending around £200 million a year on contracted out employment programmes by DWP. And on the eve of the last crisis in 2009, we were spending six times that amount. And the government's challenge now is to go from spending about 200 million to spending about 2 billion uh, on employment programmes, according to its own forecast, in the space of about a year or so. Um, I think that's probably unachievable. Um, uh, but, it, you know, we're in the position because we've largely run down our investment in employment programmes, employment support over, um, over the best part of a decade. Now, again, one of my animations has got lost here, but um, so I think um, if you're imagining ticks and crosses here, I think the government has done, it would get a tick for how it did jobs and incomes. It would get a tick largely for how it's um, provided support for the unemployed to find new jobs. Supporting skills and retraining, however, is a huge cross. Um, DfE, there's been virtually, there's been very, very little um, on skills support so far and on retraining support in this crisis. And what there has been, um, I you know, welcome a discussion about this, but I think largely doesn't reflect the challenges we're facing. Um, we've been pretty weak on support for the most disadvantaged. Um, you know, we're largely addressing the cyclical changes of this crisis rather than the structural ones that already existed. 
And I think we've been poor so far on boosting hiring and boosting demand. So that needs to be a top priority as we come out of the crisis to move into next year. And I think this means overall that we're really some way from being able to say that we can deliver a meaningful guarantee um, of support for young people um, uh, in particular as the group where I think we've got the most, the most pressing and immediate risks from this crisis. So we need to be able to, I think, we need to be able to guarantee for young people that you can get the support you need to stay in learning or to get a job. If you reach long-term unemployment, you'll be guaranteed a good job. And that needs to be underpinned by a September guarantee, as we all know, I think, of an education or a training place. At the moment, you know, we've got a lot of provision in this space for young people, but we need to do much more to join this up. So that's all the sort of problem. I think now, you know, there's, there's four big challenges i think that we're now grappling with in how we can address this and, and how we can how, how we can move out of this crisis and i think these all existed before the crisis too there's not really many more graphs to be honest which would be really pleased to hear um so i'll give you these pictures instead so the first challenge um is participation and even before this crisis far too many people who were still locked out of work about 2.1 million is now 2.2 million people who were economically inactive due to a long-term health condition, which is shown on the right, a quarter of all people who are inactive had long-term ill health. And there were nearly 2 million people who were economically inactive and wanted to work. So our unemployment figures disguised a really significant um, challenge around support for people who, who had long-term ill health and who wanted to work, but who weren't actively seeking work. And this was really different by places. There were 27 places where fewer than 70% of people were in work, even though we talked nationally about having reached full employment. Um, I think this is best exemplified in our failure to deliver meaningful progress for disabled people. But the employment rate for disabled people is still around 28 percentage points lower than it is for non-disabled people. Half of disabled people are in work, so twice as likely to be out of work as non-disabled people. Um, this has been a priority of government, successive governments actually, over the last um, over the last two decades. But it's an issue that we've you know, singularly failed to address, and even for young people. Where again, you know, youth um, NEAT rates were close to their lowest before the crisis. If you look at the proportion of young people who were economically inactive and not in full time education, which in the right hand top graph here is the yellow area, there's consistently 15%, um, one in six young people were consistently economically inactive and not in full time education. And going back to the year, dot, going back over the 20 years, we've got consistent data. And this is particularly explained again. By, um, by, okay, by ill health, by long-term ill health, and by disability. which explains about three quarters of all economic inactivity amongst young people. The second challenge I think we've got, um, uh, which, which kind of spans for IES's work, both our sort of labour market work, but also um, our work with employers, looking at HR and workplace practice around progression, um, low pay and job insecurity, people being trapped in, in low pay insecure work. So again, even before the crisis began, about one in six people were low paid and about three quarters of the low paid have been stuck in low pay or cycling in low pay for at least a decade. Um, this was characterised in particular by involuntary temporary and part time work and by people who are underemployed, meaning people who wanted to be able to work and are on zero hours contracts, for example, um, who wanted to have, have, um, have further, uh, you know, have more hours than the hours they're actually working. I mentioned about self-employment, a particular crisis in self-employment, which I haven't gone into in huge, huge detail. But we think around 3 million of the 5 million self-employed are on low income. And these are often people in solo gig work uh, and insecure work. This is again, this is most pronounced for young people, where um, about one in three young people were overqualified. So their occupational downgrading, this was before the crisis began, one in three young people in work were overqualified. And about one in seven wanted to be able to work more hours. So this is from work we did for Health Foundation, looking at over the years at, um, at changes in um, in uh, in sort of working patterns for young people. And um, work we've been doing with um, the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation has looked in particular at employer practice in low-paying sectors. Um, and in many low-paying jobs, you know, this is this, this is being driven by a business model which is characterised by trying to reduce costs. By, um, by, uh, by often paying uh, low wages, by you know, characterised by quite insecure work, um, by often poor quality services, um, and a sort of race to the bottom, if you like. Now, there are signs that attitudes were changing on this before the crisis began, um, and there's any number of really good practices that employers have been doing. We focus a lot on this in our progression employment project, particularly in low-paying sectors, 
try to improve prospects, improve job quality, control at work, access to training, job flexibility, and pay security, um, hours and pay security. And this touches any number of HR agendas. But, um, but we've got a huge way to go in, in, driving, in trying to drive lasting change amongst employers in, um, in working practices, workplace practices to support better. Now, I think that this crisis will clearly exacerbate these issues and these challenges, but it does give us a real opportunity for change. So the exacerbating will obviously come because you know, we're changing our habits, our practices, and technology and social and demographic change are all accelerating um, the impacts. But, um, but we, do also need to, um, we do also need to do much better at how we can support employers to build workforce and management resilience and support job creation, job reallocation. There's hugely, there's clearly much more we can do through public investment and probably through, um, through better quality labour market regulation, enforcement, um, and actually just increasing our, you know, the resourcing of important bodies so they, they can more proactively work with employers to support good practices and support and more effective workplace management. Now, I think career services, careers practitioners are almost uniquely well placed to address this challenge um, in particular around how we can address low pay, um, poor quality jobs and support more sustainable employment and support people to move jobs. And that means working with people who need to change their paths, you know, working with them um, alongside local services and commissioners to help to make this work. Um, but it also means, I think, testing and developing and funding and growing um, you know, new models and new initiatives that are focused on how to support people who are in work and in low paid work to progress. I think one of the key check questions for me is how we can make sure that the careers information, advice and guidance is absolutely central to labour market, labour market strategies, labour market policies that, that, that are looking to address low pay and job insecurity in the year ahead, in the years ahead. The third challenge, which speaks directly, I think, to career services is one of navigation. This comes from research we did a while ago with, um, with, with young people in particular who were trying to navigate their way through a complex system of employment skills and um, careers and welfare support. And it really sums itself up. You get a lot of information, too much information. But, you know, you're, um, you're given the ingredients, but, but, um, but you don't know how to cook. And this, and this was how we visualised it. Um, I say we, it was at my last place, um, how I visualised it for the LGA. Billions of pounds being spent um, across employment, skills, careers, narrowing gaps. Um, you know, seven different, um, six different government departments, a dozen different commissioners, dozens of funding streams, but no coherence, no ability to join us up. Um, and as a consequence, I think often everyone is responsible, but nobody um, ultimately is accountable. So how we can do that, how, how we can better um, create a more coherent system and a more sensible and more individual focused system, I think needs to be absolutely central to our public policy response, um, but also to the services that we deliver locally over the year, years ahead. And a few points this means, um, to my mind, this means ensuring that our public employment service is, um, is a genuine public employment service and not a claimant conditionality service that we're doing much more to engage those who are hardest to reach and working across services to make that work. Um, and that we're making better use of technology. And we talked about technology right at the start, which we've mentioned it right at the start. You know, it's driven an explosion in access to information, but we often don't have the time as professionals, let alone as job seekers, um, to make sense of that. And we don't have the right tools and insights to then make the right decisions. Now, clearly this requires structural change, but I do also think there are real opportunities for career services, um, for employment services, for colleges and training providers to help to lead, innovate and build the evidence and make this work locally. Final piece, which I'll just spend a minute on um, and, then I'll, and then I'll wrap up, is destitution. And there's a very timely report from JRF this week actually around this and around the risks of increased destitution. But we do need to recognise that you know, we've had a, de a decade long squeeze on living standards that Chabal mentioned at the start. Um, and it's really hard to overestimate, to overstate the impacts that welfare reform have had on low income households. So social security spending was around one fifth lower um, than it was in 2010, pre-crisis. The bottom fifth of households had lost nearly 10% of their income over the last decade in real terms. And losses have been greater for disabled people, lone parents and people with protect, and others with protected characteristics. And we've got the highest, the second highest rate of relative poverty. Of, of, of relative poverty amongst children in the EU, um, in distinguished company with Latvia. Um, now, this has fundamentally changed, I think, the services that we deliver, um, or that many of us deliver. And supporting people in financial distress has ended up being central to what we do. 
Um, now, this is going to get, get worse. And I think often career services have been have been trying to pick up the pieces and mend the fences and try to make things work for people in, in, in real hardship. Um, so I think the challenge for us is then thinking about how we can make sure that coming out of this crisis, we're always poverty proofing our work. That we're understanding local need, local destitution and disadvantage and what services are needed and should be available. That we're not just referring people on, um, but we're making sure that when we do, that they reach those services, we're sharing information and working in partnership. I think that means prioritising good work, which I don't need to tell you. But I think it also means making sure that we're looking out for our own staff, that we're able to pay living wages and living hours, and that we're recognising when staff are in hardship. So where do we go from here? I've overrun, I'm sorry, I knew that would happen. Um, a couple of really quick points. Okay. These are, um, this all feels really hard. You know, this does feel incredibly hard and new in some respects, but there are also some really familiar challenges and trade-offs that we've grappled with for a long time around what it is we're trying to do with our services, you know, work first versus social inclusion, if you like, how we work with individuals, how we work with employers, who it is we're trying to support, the trade-offs between doing things that scale in and locally, you know, um, the right job or any job, how we, you know, whether it's open to all or it's well targeted. Um, and we do need to think through these issues when you think through them clearly. And I think demand is going to outstrip supply. But I would say there's really good news in that there's clear political, social and employer will to take action to make progress. So I think this ultimately comes down to us doing four things well, and just kind of more practice and policy focused really. First, we need to make sure we've got really clear leadership, accountabilities and coordination locally. We're working to a shared set of objectives, that we're not trying to compete across, um, across provision, across services, and that we're, and that we're recognising the balance and the trade-offs between trying to support employment, trying to support incomes, trying to support professional development, career development and, and um, skills acquisition and so on. Second, we need a really relentless focus on the individual. This can't be about any individual program or service, and we must work across services. We really must. And that means co-locating and, and trying to join up and integrate services. Where we can. Third, I think we really need to tilt the scales in favour of the most disadvantaged. Um, many of us work in providing support to graduates, and that includes you know, really disadvantaged graduates too, and, and people who come from really disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, I think we need, a, as, as, um, uh, as, as well as that though, we do need a really effective focus on the people who are furthest from work, who are in the lowest incomes, and who are in the most, um, who, who, who are likely to be in, in the greatest need. And finally, I think this must be underpinned by unambiguous guarantees of support. If you need support, you will get it. It might not always be what you want, but you'll get, you know, we will help you. If you want a job, if you want help changing jobs, if you need help with, with career options, with financial planning, with anything else, we, you will get that help. And if you're young, we need a real opportunity guarantee and for the long term unemployed, I think, a guaranteed job. So just to, to wrap up, to finish, now I do think we're probably in the foothills of this crisis and the next few years are going to be tough. But I do think it's also the best opportunity that we've had for lasting change in decades. And you're really well placed to deliver it. You know, you're really well placed to play a central role in, in, in responding to this crisis and recovery. So um, you know, there's clearly a lot we need to do nationally to make this work, but I think we can all work together and hopefully um, by working together, help to help to do a bit to make work better. Thank you.